I think one of the rather important distinctive features of, of South Asia at NYU, and probably, I have to say, probably of NYU, actually, more broadly, is that there's a lot of activism uh, that's built into a lot of the ac academic work and everyday life of NYU. Um, some of it does involve uh, the world of work, both at NYU, the world of work at NYU, and um, some of it does involve the world of work uh, in the Gulf, uh, Persian Gulf, which is what we're going to be talking about um, today. Um, so I think that this problem of linking academic work and activist work together is, um, is something worth considering, and I just want to talk about it uh, for a, a minute or two. Um, the third thing is to introduce the specific uh, topic of this, uh, of this panel uh, from an academic point of view, from the point of view of someone who thinks about the world of work in a long-term historical way, who thinks about labor migration, who thinks about South Asia uh, as a place of mobility and a movement of people over long periods of time over various types of space, and who would then therefore think about contemporary uh, globalization, and particularly labor, labor mobility in the world of globalization, uh, within a pretty long-term historical framework. So those are the three jobs that I want to uh, undertake here in the next, now, 10 minutes. Okay. Um, first, the connection between the panel this morning and, and this one. Um, you, uh, if you, I'm hoping you did have a, a chance to come to the panel this morning, um, but if you didn't, I just want to, although Prabhat has now come into the room, so if I mess up his uh, presentation, he will uh, be un unhappy with me, so now I'm going to try the best I can to just say one or two things about the, the presentations this morning and how they relate to this panel. One is, probably the most important thing is that work is an extremely problematic uh, environment uh, in the world of, in the world of globalization for a whole variety of reasons, uh, many of which Prabhat laid out. But the most important being, of course, that wealth is being produced in such in the world in such a way as to, as to not only not generate enough jobs for people or good jobs for people, to, but to actually it's actually degrading the living conditions of many people, creating a struggle for a, a, a decent livelihood. It is actually getting more and more problematic for a very, very large population of the world. Okay, so that the that the search for work, the world of work, is you could say in many respects a world of greater. Um, I, I, I think desperation might be a little bit extreme, but you, that's the I, that's the sort of the direction we're we're moving in, which is that more and more people are more and more have to have are engaged in more and more uh, sort of life and death struggles for decent uh, modes of livelihood, and there's a a whole variety of ways in which that insight can play itself out, but the one that I want to point to right now is that, of course, this what this means is is that um, there's a very uh, strong tendency for there to be a kind of a bifurcation in the structure of political economy between people who control large amounts of wealth and people who are struggling for work. So that there's a just the inequity of the world of globalization isn't just an income inequity but it's actually an inequity in the control over the means of, of access to just about everything, including income, uh, education, um, life security, health, nutrition, and just about everything. So that there's this, this bifurcation is creating a world in which a, a, smaller, a, a smaller proportion of the people have increasingly larger amounts of control over the conditions under which other people live. And that that control of the conditions over which other people live is being exercised in such a way as to make that world in which other people live uh, uh, one that's more and more difficult for people who are living in it to, to get what they need. And also, it's, that control is exercised in such a way as to reduce the amount of power, the amount of influence that the people whose lives are being uh, made more problematic have over uh, the system, uh, the situation in which they're they're living. So it's actually not just a situation; it's actually a trend. And I think it, it wouldn't be too hard to map that trend in many parts of the world, but certainly uh, in Asia, it's a very uh, prominent trend. Second uh, feature of the connection between the panels this morning, and, and this one that I want to want to point out, is the disparity in the um, in the role of the state. In, in relation to the role, the kind of paradox, what Ritzi referred to as the paradox of the role of the state in relation to populations of people who live inside the state. So 
in this particular panel, I think the issue would have to do have to be the states that are exporting labor to the Gulf and states that are employing labor in the Gulf or any or anywhere else. These states have very particular interests. They represent particular uh, kinds of, uh, of desires and of necessities with respect to capital accumulation. In the case of places like Bangladesh or Nepal or other places or in India, states in India that are sending labor or Sri Lanka or Philippines, any number of countries that are sending labor, they have a very strong interest in maintaining that flow of labor. The remittances from that labor are extremely important to those states. The living conditions of the people who are um, uh, earning those remittances are, shall we say, of, at, at least of secondary importance to the continued uh, ability of those states to maintain the flow of the workers. Um, and this is true not just for work, but it's for true uh, for exports of, of any kind. We could talk about shrimp as another good example. It's very important for the exports of shrimp to keep going so that they can show up in the Morton Williams and our grocery stores here, uh, no matter what kind of ecological degradation and lifestyle de demolition they're involved in on the coast of Bangladesh or India or <coughs> Latin America or Africa, or other places where shrimp is being produced, or uh, now it's a lot, lots of it's coming from Southeast Asia. So. <clears throat> the, the, the exporting states have a very strong interest in the flow of the resources that are producing the income that for a place like Bangladesh or other countries is a very, very large percentage of their, uh, of their, of their net, of their uh, foreign exchange earnings. In, in the case of Bangladesh, export of labor and export of garments are the two largest uh, um, uh, earners of, of, of foreign exchange. And those are precisely the areas within which we find highly precarious labor conditions being produced uh, by the system through which these export earnings are being generated. So the state has this kind of interest in the maintenance of a global uh, system of flows and of accumulation, which is, shall we say, paradoxically, in, in Rithi's vocabulary, um, able to maintain the interest of the state that in, in, a, in a way that does not directly uh, um, prevent the state from aiding and abetting the, the uh, really uh, de de derogatory labor conditions for, for the workers. And of course, in the Gulf or in the, in this, in the, in the labor receiving places, the, the, the interest is very much the same. You want to keep the, 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 the workers flowing. You want to maintain the, um, the flow of the assets. But you have control over the conditions of employment. So the government's there. The employing company, they have control over the conditions of employment whereas the sending governments do not have control of the conditions of employment. And the question is how these two how these states are relating uh, to their workers. So this political aspect of it that Kanchin was talking about and uh, Prabhat referred to uh, is really quite important as a context for us here. Okay. The second uh, project, which I'm now going to undertake in two minutes, um, is, simply, is simply to say that it is important to remember that academic work and activist work are both connected to each other, but they are not the same. This is my... My, 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 main, my main argument, it is always possible to engage in an activist argument in such a way uh, that you are basically um, maintaining a partisan stance that will brook no opposition. Okay, in other words, there's a, there's a very strong tendency in certain kinds of activist work to say, my position is my position and I do not want anybody to mess up, mess, my, mess, mess around with my position and anybody who who's been here and been involved in politics or activism or anything else will realize that that's a, that's, a, and that's a necessity. You have to be able to do that. You have to be able to man your guns and hold on to them. In academics, of course, we have to be able to do that too sometimes, but we also have to be able to take the guns out of our hands and put it on the table and say, okay, this is the gun that I'm going to use and I'm going to have to look at it. I'm going to have to think about it and I have to also think about the other guns in the room because I have to think about you know, who, who else is out here, and I have to be able to look at it from a different perspective. These, these two ways of, 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 of working can be, really be very useful in relation to one another, but they often have um, moments, shall we say, of, of conflict, of, 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 of difficulties, where the conversations become a little bit difficult. The third part, I'm going to say, is probably where the difficulty will come in, which is that labor migration today is part of a very, very long history of labor migration. In South Asia, workers have been uh, been moving from one part, from villages to cities, among villages to towns, from towns to cities, from region to region for, for a very, very long time. If you just imagine the seasonality of the monsoon, you imagine what you imagine what the life of work has been, the world of work has been like in South Asia for uh, thousands of years, which is that when the monsoon, when it's the, the dry season, people move 
They go out to work, they go out to fight, they go out to build buildings, they go out, they, they show up in Delhi in large numbers, or they show up in any city and they start working in construction projects, temporary labor, circular migration, there for a season, take the money and go back home. So in other words, this idea that workers, it, work isn't in a place, work is not in, locked in a place like in a village or a town or a city and so on. Work, you can think of the world of work as a work of migration from one set of conditions to another, very often, and in fact, very typically, typically driven by um, seasonally understandable um, periods of distress, where the distress actually drives people to look for working, to look for work under conditions that they might not normally accept. In other words, even like a famine, you notice, you'll notice that there's such a thing called famine food. Famine food is food that people will eat during a famine that they would never eat any other time. It includes things like weeds and uh, even certain kinds of dirt kids will be found. Kids with Kwashiorkor, core, in fact, it's one of the, um, one of the ways you uh, diagnose Kwashiorkor core is kids start eating dirt because they're looking for iron and so on in, the, in there. Well, that's the, that's the theory anyway. But the point is weeds and all sorts of you know, stuff and animals that you would never eat. Okay, so that's famine food. The analogy to that is we might call it famine work. People, Mark Desan and various other people have described the way in which under conditions of distress, people will do types of work that they wouldn't otherwise do. Uh, they will do work that's less respectable. They'll undertake lower status jobs, lower paid jobs. And especially at times of distress, people are flooding into these jobs because more and more people need them. Okay, so in other words, the, it, you can think of it as lowering the, lowering the wage rate, but you can also think of lots of people rushing in to a labor situation where they all need the dough. They may only need it for a temporary, it may be temporary, but it may be longer periods of time. The, the world we're in today, to return to the first uh, section of our uh, uh, conversation, is a world in which more and more people are rushing into more and more precarious and desperate working situations. They are struggling more and more for decent jobs, okay? And in a situation where more and more people are struggling for decent jobs, it is very difficult to mobilize workers or mobilize collectives around the collective desire to improve working conditions because they're all individually struggling to get on that plane, to get off the airplane, to get their visa, to get their, um, the, the debt that they need to incur in order to be able to pay the airfare to go to Abu Dhabi or to the, go to the Gulf or go uh, to Malaysia or anywhere else. That's, that's their struggle. Their struggle is to get on the plane, get off the plane, get the job, get the paycheck, and take it home. That's where their struggle is. And it's a, it's a version of a struggle that's been going on for many, for many centuries, a seasonal migration, but sometimes a longer seasonal migration, a year or two years. Now it's very, com very common in the Gulf, two to three years even. But sometimes shorter cycles of migration. Very much analogous to cycles of migration into the city to work in construction jobs. Uh, for, for example, t migrations to move into the city to work as um, a rickshaw drivers or other things that people do temporarily during seasons of distress and then move back home. So there's all sorts of very difficult working conditions that people are entering into, we might say, voluntarily. But under conditions of duress, and those conditions of duress are becoming more uh, compelling for more and more people in the world of work today. So with that introduction, I will then hand it over to my esteemed colleague, Naeem Mohammed, who will uh, introduce the rest of our program. Thanks.